I just want to say thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you, you know, for taking the time. There's a lot going on on the vineyard this week and today and you know but thank you all so much for taking the time you know this whole conversation is about the transformative power of storytelling and dreaming forward and i want to show you all a teaser this summer i had an opportunity to work with 67 hbcu students from 17 different hbcus and we worked in san francisco and what I did was I produced a documentary where we tracked their whole experience in San Francisco. But the, the fun and beautiful thing is, is that there's a mentee of mine, a 20 year old student from Camden, New Jersey, where I'm from. He's now a rising junior at Morehouse. And he directed this documentary. So he's a state, he, he directs theater, but now he's getting into directing film and television. So I had an opportunity to mentor him over six weeks in San Francisco. And this kid is about to be our next, like Malcolm Lee, Spike Lee, you name it. And, um, but I just wanna show you all a teaser for a documentary that we're working on called Black to San Francisco and it's directed by my mentee, uh, Hockey Pratt. And after that, we'll have a conversation with myself and my best friend since I was 16, Tisha Campbell Martin. <laughs> Tisha Campbell, I'm sorry. Oh, God. <laughs> Lord have mercy. <laughs> and her producing partner, Danny Wright. <laughs> For though, y'all know. <laughs> But anyway, please have a look at the teaser. It's only a minute, and then we'll have the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. And Hockey was playing the drums as well, by the way. He's also a musician. But thank you all. And the moderator is Dr. Cheryl Davis, who's head of the Human Rights Commission in San Francisco. Hello, hello, everyone. All right, good afternoon. How's everybody doing? Um, I am really just honored and humbled. First, I want to thank the film festival for having us and letting us be here. Give it up for them for hosting this. Um, I'm Cheryl Davis, the director of the Human Rights Commission, which Sidra already mentioned. And I just, I want to first and foremost just thank these ladies who are up here because so often, Folks talk about what they want to do and how they want to give back and how committed they are to community and they want to tell stories. And each one of them I met in community and they said, oh, I really want to follow up. And I've heard that no less than a thousand times and usually nobody follows up. And when Tisha connected me with Danny and said, we really want to do something, and Danny actually called me back with Tisha on the phone, I almost had a heart attack. <laughs> And then when I met Sidra, just a little over, a little less than a year ago, and said, hey, we wanna do storytelling and we wanna center community voices, um, and I want you to work with the folks because it might not be as clean as you are used to, she also agreed. And so the, the idea of being committed to telling the stories of folks, not exploiting the stories, but actually partnering with folks to tell those stories, I just wanna thank you for being committed to actually doing what you said. So we definitely, just we appreciate it. And thank you thank for you. doing yes. what you do. And so with that, I, I wanna, you know, cause you could do anything, right? You don't have to actually be in the Western edition of Fillmore or running around with college students and, and being engaged in these, like what makes you want to stay connected in that way and tell these stories? Well, do you mind if I start? Well, especially with Faces of the City and being able to produce this and, and get our hands dirty in it, we just wanted to serve others. And this is the life's work that I've really, really always wanted to do. I love what I do, but producing and being able to connect to community, to be able to tell stories about the unsung heroes, and the givers, the people who are, and also the people who are in need, the receivers. A lot of people didn't even know that some of these programs existed. And we wanted to highlight that and be able to give back to our community. And then from there, go together from city to city to city to do the same thing. I remember as a child, as a child doing Reaganomics, 
once Reaganomics came in and programs like these, like Uncle Stank's programs were taken out of my community. I'm from Newark, New Jersey, and I grew up in the projects. I know I played a lot of budgie roles, but, <laughs> but I just remember as a child feeling lost and having nothing else to do in them streets. And, um, and a lot of my fellow, my friends, my family, the same. Um, to be able to highlight things like this, to be able to do this kind of work or to use my platform to do this kind of work is the most important thing to me. So that's why I'm doing it and that's, that's why it's so important to me. Oh, that's great. Um, it's kind of the same for me and once we knew what we were gonna do together, I think it's very important to show the world that these kind of programs is, is, exist. Because growing up, I'm from New Orleans, and I grew up in a single parent home, and my mother could, probably could have used the help, probably could have used the finances, probably could have used everything. And so I think my goal for this is to spread the word, and if we can use our platform to do that, I'm here to do that and to serve, so. You know, when I die, you know, I want a thousand years from now, a hundred years from now, I want to be a part of that reference point. You know, when people are trying to figure out what were black people doing in the 20th century, yeah. you know, I want some of the work that I've touched to be some of those things that people look at. I mean, when you think about it, if we don't tell our own stories, who's gonna do it? Yeah. You know, so I, I, I just believe that it's just important for us to go in community, learn about what's happening, share, and, um, and tell our own stories so that, you know, we have a reference point with our narrative to leave behind. Um, I think as you Wait, I'm sorry, I have to say this is a little surreal for me because <laughs> Many, many years ago, I produced Citra. Well, first of all, I've known Citra since she was actually 15 years old. And um, I was able to produce her very first film. And so she it's did. a little. In 1999. Yes. <laughs> so to see her where she's grown as a filmmaker, it's really beautiful to see. So kudos to my friend. Aww. No, seriously. And I just have to say, like, we all know, like, for all the filmmakers in here, we all know how hard it is. So this was my first movie in 1999 and I needed help. And to have a friend who's the star of a TV show called Martin. Child, please. <laughs> I, was, like, I, was, I, I was everything on that set except for the DP. I was the craft service. Was. I was holding the boom. We borrowed some of her wardrobe. I, yes. <laughs> but no, but it's like, and I appreciate it like the the passion of filmmaking and to have friends who who help you. I mean, back then, it's like back in the day, like that was the bomb. I was like, the bomb? You but, know, but even with we that, had Gina's clothes on our characters. But, but I think what you all are doing is actually helping because not everybody has friends in those spaces and places. And so how do you create this opportunity to say like, well, what is the boom, right? What is craft services? Like all of these different, the language that you were able to learn or benefit on, benefit from. But even beyond that, when we think about storytelling, because you, you know, comedy, singing, music, spoken word, like there's so many different ways to tell stories. Like how are you leveraging your platform to be able to help people understand the diversity within the storytelling? Oh. Um. Well, I get a different high from everything that I do. If I'm in front of the camera, I get a certain high. If I'm behind the camera, I get a definite certain high. Um, now, stand up, I'm getting a high. But there are so many different ways to tell our stories because we are a diverse people. And, and we have to be in charge of how, like she said, if somebody doesn't tell our, if we don't tell our stories, actually somebody's going to frame it. Facts. And going to tell what they feel we are. And because we were so diverse, and I've always wanted to be a storyteller, actually, this all kind of came about because of the COVID isolation. For the first time in my life, I was in a space where I didn't 
have to hear the noise. I didn't have to hear someone tell me what I could or could not do. And I had to sit along with myself and then everything that I ever wanted to do in life, that's when I took the opportunity to start writing. So as, um, as a, I've always wanted to be a writer, but there were people in my ear telling me, no, you can't be a filmmaker, no, you can't write, no, you can't direct or produce, Keep your, stay in your lane. And I listened to it. After hearing it so many times, I became stagnant in my create. But just like we can, just like there's so many different ways to tell um, our stories, I wanted to be a part of the diaspora that changed, uh, that changed the diaspora of how people viewed us. Love that, thank you. Well, you got I think she answered it. Look, look. I mean, you, I you did. No, I think no. you answered it. I'm, I'm, I'm like, I need you to repeat it again. Oh, no. shit. <laughs> look, what I said. look, look, I was a teacher. I was like, were you listening? <laughs> she wasn't, she wasn't listening. You weren't even listening to me. You were like, <laughs> no, I, I think that ultimately is like, what are the different ways that, like, I, for instance, I, I want to give a shout out to Sidra. You heard the drumming in the, um, in the reel. That young man is a drummer, and he did not bring his drum to San Francisco. And when Sidra found out that he had that talent, she went and bought him a drum. Mm -hmm. And then told him he needed to play that drum for the, the, the video. So what you hear is him actually playing it as the young man who is the director of the film that was encouraged not just to be the director, but to actually play the drum Versify as a part of Versify his talents and right? show it all, yeah. And so that's my point, is that you understand storytelling beyond just like putting a camera in front of someone. Like you understood that he was telling a story playing that drum, or even the story of his drum. Like how are you leveraging that to continue to do the work that you're doing? You know what's amazing is that, and, and it's true, there are so many, I did hear you earlier, wait, I was paying attention. Because one of the things that she said was, there are so many different forms of storytelling, you know? And when I talked to this young man about his drumming and why he's been playing the djembe since two and he's now 20, he said it's because he likes to call in the ancestors. And I was like, deep. <laughs> I was like, well, we need to call in the ancestors to this film you're directing. And he was like, wow, because that is a part of it. So it is, it's like, and I'll just say, if we give young people the tools, and if we give them like the energy and the confidence, like, they can do anything. And one of the things that really inspired me, you know, you talked about be hanging out with, with a bunch of HBCU students. Normally every summer, I'm in Europe. I'm in Italy. <laughs> Come on. This summer, I had the best summer of my life hanging out with these 67 HBCU students. It was phenomenal and you know, we took them, and Dr. Davis, she's the one that scheduled all these fabulous things because she said these kids need to experience the best life has to offer so that they know they can have it. So we took these kids to Napa Valley for the weekend, and, and they were not, you know, the ones who were over 20 got to wine taste. 21. Over you, 21, I'm sorry. She sound like the young man. That I was, was like, me back when I, no, Oh, that's why that, that's why that 20 year old had that wine. No. Sandra <laughs> gave it to him. No. <laughs> but can I just tell y'all, and y'all will see it when this film comes out, the joy, like when these kids showed up, and then at the end of the six weeks to see their confidence and then their head just way up high. I was like, these kids are about to take over the world. You know, but, but yeah, there are so many different ways and, um, and I do love and appreciate how hockey pulled the drums into that storytelling and um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a blessing. I wouldn't do anything else in the world. This is what I'm doing for the rest of my life. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I want to just, and then we're going to, I know, start to wrap up a little bit, but I think the thing that, that resonated the most with me is really your willingness to like be here, to be at, in New Orleans, to think about how you continue to share these stories. Like, why use your platform to amplify? 
why not just think about like how you can find the next thing that's going to actually make you money? Because I never got into this business for money or fame or power or position or control. I started out as uh, a child actor or a child singer and went into acting because my family didn't have. I understood that, I understood how poor we were. Yes, we had found happiness and we were happy amongst each other and I, yes, there was love in my household, but there was also mayonnaise sandwiches for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. There was also syrup sandwiches. There was a dollar's worth of bologna and a dollar's worth of cheese for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, and so, God, that made me emotional. <laughs> and I've said it before. Um, but I understood the needs of my family, which I took throughout my entire career, both on camera and behind the scenes, is that I want to help people. The very first thing I ever did professionally was won my family a car in a talent contest. And I remember my mother crying and, and understanding that she, we didn't have a car. So I knew that I could help others. So I always, that was the theme of my entire career. And now that I'm doing more behind the scenes, I can feel that I'm doing what I actually have always wanted to do, which was to use my platform to make it better for others. That's why I do what I do. I mean, I don't have a huge platform, but um, I think mine, again, as I stated earlier, it's to get the message out there, let people know these programs exist. Like, I don't know where everybody lives in here, but I'm sure there's programs people don't know about in your city that can help them move forward, get help, get finances, get uh, mental help, all of those things. And so I think the reason that I'm doing is, is to help people in those ways and help them get the information and the access. <laughs> you know, the thing that I love about documentaries in particular is that you have an opportunity not only to teach, but also to learn. And it's like, so I feel that I use my platform to teach and to learn. And, um, and, and through storytelling and... Uh, that's why. That's good. <laughs> I mean, I love that as a, a former teacher, I love the, the notion of teaching and learning. And so, um, so many different thoughts in my head. And I just keep going back to the power of storytelling. Mm -hmm. Like that is the, what has drawn me to each of the works that you've done is the power of storytelling. And so with this theme of dreaming forward, and, and I think Saida started the conversation saying, um, you know, our real focus has been to make sure that the history and legacy, and Dr. Buck talked about it in terms of the Black Panther Party in Oakland, that it's not erased, right? And so when we think about what's happening with book bans, when we think about what's happening with what we can talk about in terms of diversity, equity, inclusion, how we talk about equity in classrooms and schools, um, this dreaming forward, like building off of that notion, I guess my kind of, what I would love for you to end with in this conversation is like, what's the dream for the future, right, in terms of storytelling, in terms of the impact of your work, in terms of um, what doesn't get left, right? Like you talk about wanting to make sure that 100 years, 1,000 years, but what's the story? Like what's the most important or the, the theme of stories that you want to make sure doesn't get erased through time? I can jump in real quick, because I know, I want to tell stories about black women. You know, black women, young people, because, Stories, especially documentaries about black women are some of the most difficult stories to get funding for. And I just feel like, you know. Yeah, but me? Sidra. <laughs> <laughs> you did the most amazing documentary on mental health for yes, black men. Yes, yes. And I was, don't, girl. It was really, really powerful. And it made me want to make sure that my two sons were taken care of here. So yes, I do understand your passion mm -hmm. for telling our stories, but you have touched in 
different ways as well. So you. you gotta talk about that too. I'm sorry. Well, no, I'm never gonna leave black men out. At all. <laughs> At all. In the name of Jesus. <laughs> But you're so no. good, and it was so good, Sidra. So yes, I, again, I understand your, your your passion for us, and we love that, ladies, don't we? But but I love that your storytelling lends itself to so many different Thank stories. You. So please talk about that too. Well, <laughs> I'll put her on the spot. I know. Well, no, I did, and I wish we would have shown it here. But you know, as one of the other pieces that I did in San Francisco, it was an amazing, beautiful doc about black men in the Bay Area who are getting free mental health therapy. And these men just talked about how much it changed their lives, changed their family. So definitely not gonna leave our men out. Okay. But okay, I'm sorry. Yes, but you know, it's like I had an opportunity to do a documentary on Angela Davis called Free Angela and All Political Prisoners. It took, I can't even tell y'all what it took to get that movie over the finish line. I'm sure. Finishing a film now on Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, the uh, former president of Liberia. My God, we're still trying to get that movie over the finish line. So are you saying that it's a little harder to do? Oh my God, for Brighter Futures, the story about the black men in mental health. You got it done so quick. quick. Interesting. That's really but, um, interesting. But anyway, I love my black men and my black women. <laughs> good, good job. And as far as me, I'm gonna keep it really short. Um, do you wanna go first, Danny? Okay, so as far as me, I'm gonna keep it really short. Sure. <laughs> no, um, I grew up in a time where there were no um, people representing me on camera. There weren't a lot, rather. Um, I remember when I was doing this show, um, I think I was about 16, it was called Roxy Riches. It, 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 went, it went double wood. Um, nobody saw it, I'm sure, but I was, I was the only little girl on television that was African American at the time. Tootie had just gone off and, and Facts of Life was no longer on, so it's just me. And I wanna see us on screen in different ways. That's what's important to me and that's my goal. Um, same here. So I'm a producer at You Go Girl Productions, which is Tisha's company, and that was one of our things that we wanted to do, as she stated, is to um, do more films and series and everything for our community, um, regardless of what it is. We just want to show us in a different light, show us, you know, like even with health care, and there's so many things we need, so many things we want to say, and so many spaces we aren't in that we want to see us in. So that's our goal for our production company. Give it up for Sidra Smith, Tisha Campbell, and Danny Wright. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Everybody Davis. for being here. <laughs>